Hi, I'm Ethan Wayne with the John Hamilton Collection, and you are listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm Tom Guild. Nowhere in the world celebrates modernism better than Palm Springs, California. Every February, it's Modernism Week, an architecture and design festival that actually lasts 11 days. U.S. Modernist Radio is there, interviewing nearly all of Modernism Week's keynote speakers and other special guests. It all happens at the U.S. Modernist Compound, poolside at the Hotel Skylark. We all love mid-century modernism, but what about new modernist houses? How much do you follow the past versus innovating for the future? After all, we're not the same culture and technology and building materials we were in the 1950s. And what about renovations? Today's show features author and architect Anthony Poon, L.A. architects Brett Woods and Joe Dangaran, and designer and homeowner Sean Gaston, who's working on a project close to our hearts, a hyperbolic paraboloid house. If you were asleep during high school geometry class, don't worry. Just think of a Pringles potato chip that curves in two directions. It's a hyperbolic paraboloid you can eat. Other famous examples include the Tramway Gas Station in Palm Springs, designed by Albert Frey, and the Catalano House in Raleigh, North Carolina, sadly destroyed, designed by Eduardo Catalano. It's all coming up today. And you may have heard us mention the Hotel Skylark. It's our home away from home when we're in Palm Springs for Modernism Week. The Skylark is a classic 60s-style, modernist-style motel. All the rooms face a very nice, heated swimming pool with a stunning view of the San Jacinto Mountains. Your morning starts with a breakfast buffet, starring some very tasty frittatas, waffles, fruit, coffee, and all sorts of other goodies. Once you're fueled up for the day, you're ready to walk the short distance to houses, exhibits, shopping, and more. Whatever you want to do in Palm Springs, the U.S. modernist compound at the Hotel Skylark is right in the middle of everything. And now, a very late convert to VRBO slash Airbnb house rentals, your host, Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Thank you, Tom. Because I was a management consultant for so many years and traveled the country, I'm basically a hotel guy. I know all the ins and outs of the networks and the brands and the frequent stay programs and the breakfast deals and the bars and all of that. It's just something I got used to traveling so much. But this past year, for the first time, I rented a house through Airbnb in Palm Springs. Oh, It was a little, relatively small Bill Kreisel house, just beautiful jewel box kind of house, three small bedrooms, a living room, a little pool in the back a little hot tub, a little fire pit, classic Palm Springs, and stayed in it for a week. And I got to tell you, I am a convert now for when my wife and I are traveling together in Palm Springs. It was just such a pleasant experience. And one night, we had a few people over and had dinner, and it was like almost traveling back in time to 1964. Those movies that I saw growing up of people in these exact same houses, I was recreating right there in this small dinner party. It was really fabulous. If you are into mid-century modernism, Modernism Week is just the place to be. It is so fabulous. And I hope you can join us out there in 2024. Stay with us at the Hotel Skylark, a.k.a. the U.S. Modernist Compound. Just email me at george at usmodernist.com. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman Family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. Past podcast guest, architect, artist, classically trained pianist, and author Anthony Poon returns to talk about his Modernism Week talk on the myth of mid-century modernism with a challenge to today's architects not to turn what was once innovative into a mere cliché. Poon is the principal of Los Angeles-based Poon Design, founded in 2001. He's the author of three books in architecture, as well as a mystery novel, Death by Design and Alcatraz, which you may have heard excerpts from here on past shows. 
He's also written Sticks and Stones, Steel and Glass, a collection of autobiographical essays. Here's George's conversation with Anthony Poon at the U.S. Modernist booth inside the Palm Springs Convention Center. Anthony, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much, George. Happy to be here. We really loved hearing you read from your latest book. That was a unique experience. <laughs> I, I, I'm an author, not necessarily an orator, so it was an interesting experiment for, for me to read my own novel. Anthony wrote Death by Design at Alcatraz and did some readings from the book for us about a year or so ago, which was great. The first time we'd done that, it was like our own audio book. Yeah, yeah. Really. And uh, you told me that you probably have another book in the works, right? Uh, I'm working on the sequel to that novel. Okay. Uh, I'm is, about this, is this to, Burial at Alcatraz? or <laughs> It's called Death by Design at Hollywood Hills. Oh, okay. It's a, a continuation of the, of the story. Yeah. I'm about two-thirds of the way through. It's a, a little different of a plot line, some of the same characters. Okay. Here at Modernism Week, you spoke about some of the myths of modernism, which I'm, I'm fascinated to hear what those were and which ones we should hang on to and which ones we should let go of. Well, it was a great audience. Uh, yesterday at the Annenberg Theater, I presented basically two parts. The first was questioning why there is such an obsession with mid-century modern design and architecture. Why is that? Well, it's kind of multi-pronged. There's a little bit of the nostalgia. I think there was a kind of lifestyle that people yearned for, uh, maybe good, happy memories. It's, it's captured uh, in photography, Julius Shulman. It's captured in art by Shag. We saw a lot of it in, in Mad Men. But I really questioned why we approach that one particular style with such a passion. For example, right now we have 100,000 attendees here at Modernism Week celebrating and honoring mid-century modern design. Why don't we have 100,000 celebrating Victorian architecture or colonial design or 18th century neoclassical? The question is, isn't mid-century just another style? Why particularly is this one uh, such a, a focus of obsession? I critiqued the way most people have approached mid-century modern in, in home design and, and kind of saw it negative as a paint by numbers. Okay. We all know the pieces that people obtain to create their mid-century modern dream house from post and beam construction to Eames lounge chair, Barcelona pieces, the Gucci lamp, Nelson bubble, yeah, all the kind of things that we know down to the avocado green kitchen cabinetry. And uh, the more I looked at these projects, the more they kind of all looked the same. And I asked, where is the personality? Where is the individual take on this? My phrase is that we should honor mid-century modern, but let's not embalm it. Okay. And in that sense, a chapter of my presentation was called Mid-Century Mania, and play on words turned mid-century modern into living in a mid-century museum, or even worse, a mid-century mausoleum. And I suggested people should not live in a period piece. We should look at this movement as a platform to move forward and to honor the past, acknowledge the legacy, but move forward and take a look at some new ideas. So how does one do that within modernism? What's the way to move forward architecturally? That was my, the second half of my presentation. I identified the 12 themes of mid-century modern and showed through our work at Poon Design how we reinterpreted those themes for, for new ideas and new architectural solutions. For example, one of the, the most known themes is the open floor plan. Very popular concept. We did away with compartmentalizing residential rooms. Uh, no longer would my mom be cooking in a, a kitchen completely enclosed by four walls. It, it was a great move and it's a very strong concept for mid-century modern. We apply it still to our modern homes today in Palm Springs, but we also apply, for example, to a school project. At the presentation, I showed one of our schools in Chicago. A hallway is usually quite congested. Standard is 12 feet wide, 10 feet tall, lined with lockers on both sides. Uh, we all know this image of, of middle school and high school. And all the banging of the lockers. All the banging, all the excitement as well as bullying, all the positives and negatives. It, it, it was uh, the basis of a lot of school architecture. We decided to take the open floor plan and apply that to a school. We started by making a, the hallway not 12 feet wide, but 60 feet wide. 
The ceiling is not 10 feet, but 30 feet. Within this hallway, as an open floor plan, we put in all the community functions of this school. The library, the conference rooms, the math room, the, the STEM lab, the metal shop, science, all in this one space loosely divided by low walls, by partitions, by floor level changes, and in fact took the open floor plan idea that you see from the 50s and applied it to a school built recently. And it's been quite successful. The, the students no longer feel like they're wandering down a congested hallway, but now really part of a community that's mm -hmm. very active, very energetic. What about for houses? What's the future for houses and residential design? The future really stems around the idea of flexibility and adaptability. Now, we've done so many open floor plans, and unfortunately during the pandemic, that had to be revisited. Some homes thought maybe it shouldn't be so open, maybe it needs to be divided, but at the same time, we didn't want to compartmentalize these homes. Uh, we still want that flexibility because we are social beings. Families entertain, but they also live together as a group, as a team. Uh, so we start designing homes with more flexibility, with elements that implied room separation, but not physically a wall. Within residential design now in, in 2023, is there any feature that's really taking off that's the hot new thing to have in houses? The hot new thing is, is probably more philosophical. I, I, I think of two things. One, it used to be about quantity. It used to be how big of a house you can get, how many square feet, how that many That was bedroom. the 90s, right, really? Uh, 90s and even into the 2000s that okay. you still see throughout the country, people wanting bigger and bigger homes. Now the trend really is towards quality. We're, we're actually designing homes that aren't that big, but of a higher quality. The materials, the details, the lighting, the finishes of, are of a higher quality. We do a lot of homes for developers mm -hmm. who are building them spec and selling them in the marketplace. I would say 10 years ago, 20 years ago, developers wanted to build big homes fast and cheap and, and believed that this was the way to maximize their profit. Now they're building smaller, and higher quality and doing things that you would never have thought of that a developer would do, putting in luxurious stone, putting in gourmet appliances, putting in enormous, and I wouldn't say enormous, but very luxurious resort style master bathrooms. These elements, this level of quality has shown to be even more profitable. And that's what people are seeking, a quality home. We know the number of track home communities that people buy and you go into the homes and they're kind of cheap. They don't look great, they don't wear well. The developers that we work with now are really turning that upside down, saying yes, we could spend a lot more on these and business-wise, it actually makes more money. Now part two to your question is the general philosophy of sustainability, of being a, a steward for our environment and the future. So mm -hmm. there's no one feature, but it's, but it's taking into consideration energy conservation, recycled content, rapidly renewable materials, gray water storage, yeah. all those kind of things are, are not a single feature. It's not saying, oh, we all want this color cabinetry or, or this kind of bathroom sink. It's saying that the house needs to be very aware of, of what we're doing in design, in construction, and how a home operates down the road. Okay. And what about the, the power for these houses? Is there still a strong demand for solar or little wind power devices on it, or how is that going? Oh, for certain. There are codes coming into play right now that are requiring homes that have PV, photovoltaic, and generate as much power as possible. Uh, the goal has always been to, to go net zero. It's very difficult. If you could create a net zero house and actually collect enough energy and sell it back to the grid, that's, that's an ideal situation. It's pretty hard to, to do but the goals are there to, to make an energy efficient home. But what about water? I've always heard that that was really the hardest one because you can, you can go out and buy a lot of solar panels eventually to right. power your house, right. but a lot of the way the water systems and sewer systems work in this country, it's very difficult to have your own water source. The cities just get freaked out about that. A lot of it is, is really more about water conservation than, than the water source. I have colleagues in Europe who are shocked that in America, we flush our toilets with the same water that we drink. That's an amazing co concept to think about. We, we here in the U.S. don't think about it at all, but that quality of water is, is really being wasted. 
Yeah. Uh, which, which is where water systems of, of gray water or being able to collect certain water that's used for landscape irrigation mm -hmm. or, or flushing of a toilet doesn't have to be the same water that we drink as tap water. What about these units I hear of that you put on your roof or whatever and they extract water from the air? I have to say I'm no expert on that. I, I've read some articles, yeah. but I, I don't know. I, I know that in the city they're building in Saudi Arabia, they are using a technique to create rain from shepherding it in the clouds. Mm. Now, it sounds like a sci-fi theme. Yeah. I guess I'd have to ask a, a scientist uh, what they think about, about ideas like that. I mean, I want one of those. I want yeah. to put one of those <laughs> in my roof so I can pull the water into the house because they're supposed to generate, like even in somewhat dry climates, right? Right. like Saudi right. Arabia, there's a lot of moisture still in the air. Yeah, it's like a way of forcing the, the sky to create moisture. Of course, eventually, you know what will happen Anthony, is that there'll be this big movement to have all these units, and then they'll figure out it's hurting the planet, too. You know, yeah, we'll have yeah, to stop. Yeah, we'll find out later <laughs> that it's the, the next asbestos or, you know, some mode in the drywall or, or something like that. Yeah, we, we have to be very careful with some of these novel ideas, ideas before we implement them globally. How has it been for you becoming a novelist? Uh, it's been great. My first two books were nonfiction and they okay. were more about architecture and and I thought why not put together the ideas that that I've gathered in my mind practicing as an architect and and give it a kind of fictional twist yeah we all know the the ego and the creativity in the field of architecture exists and how far would we go to actually win a job how competitive would architects go to win a new museum? And it didn't seem that far-fetched to me that an architect might murder to, to actually win a project. Oh, yeah. It might really take out the competition. <laughs> when you hear, oh, I would kill for that job, perhaps we're talking literally. Have you ever seen that movie, The Competition? Oh. This is a little-known documentary. It's I, called The Competition. Okay. It was filmed by the government of Andorra, which is a nation okay. between France and Spain. And a number of years ago, the government decided, I think they wanted a new national museum. So they put out bids. Right. And one of the conditions of the bid was that you had to let a video crew come into your architecture practice. Wow. And, and film how you replied to the bid. That is the one of the plot lines in, in my yeah. book. So the, you should try to get your hands on that movie and really get, enjoy it. it. It is, as I call it, taking architecture as a spectator sport. Yes. And, and rather than watching us work in our offices, in my novel, they're all, all the contents are gathered in one place and had to design and produce work all while audience members are able to watch the, the creative process. It's like a game show in a way, right? It's like a reality TV, TV show. TV show, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was fascinated to learn about the way competitions work globally, and that there are people who actually specialize in organizing competitions right? yes. for their clients. Right, right. We had one on a number of years ago. I mean, this is huge business because these commissions are often gigantic. And the architects that participate spend a lot of money and time, sometimes months, three months, six months of producing work, producing ideas, all for free, or sometimes a moderate stipend, but yeah. all for that one chance of winning a very prestigious job. The well-known competitions would be like the memorial for 9-11 in New York City, where I believe it was over 3,000 entries had submitted their proposed idea. Everyone spending their own time and money to generate beautiful models and renderings. They're only gonna pick one. Yeah. Uh, but the opportunity of that one to be the architect that designs the the of that World iconic Trade Center. location. Yeah, that memorial would be amazing. Let's say there's a, a $500 million project out there. So in terms of paying staff, how much does it cost an architecture firm to, to put together a bid for something like that? If it is a design competition and it is a major company with a marketing budget, it could be 500000 It wow. could be a million. Uh, I, I know in companies I've worked, I've seen our team spend that much. You put a team of five people, ten people on it for months, generating ideas and meetings and research, it, it can add up. And they usually build models, right? We've built 
big models. And again, keep in mind, this is all on spec. Yeah, right. Yeah. They, they, they would tell you that the odds are maybe one in six. They may have shortlisted six firms to compete. It's a lot of money. But like you said, this could be a $500 million project. Yeah. If it's a, a world-class museum, it could put you on the map. It could change your your whole right. career arc. Because with architecture fees, you know, you're talking like 50 to 75 million roughly. In fees, you're going to take off of that kind of project. It's right. really huge money. It's it's huge money. It's a big game and it's a, we participate in competitions maybe once a year. Yeah. Very selectively choosing. We recently submitted our proposal to a competition in downtown Los Angeles for the 1871 memorial of the Chinese massacre. Oh, right. And we spent a lot of a lot of time. We did not make the shortlist. Sometimes yeah. we won. Sometimes we we we've lost. Yeah. Uh, but it was a, an emotional drain to put that much time and money and energy and and not win. So how many architects did you have to kill, Anthony, for that one? Uh, I was lucky to, to <laughs> not have to kill anyone. Uh, but there was a list. Yeah, I see. there was a list. That's great. What's next for you besides this new novel that you're working on? What kind of, of projects is your firm working on now? A lot of uh, the work right now is mixed use and housing. Um, there's no question that, that there is a demand for housing. One of the, the newer projects we're talking to building owners about is called Office to Residential Conversion. There are office buildings throughout Los Angeles that are empty due to the pandemic. Of course, yeah. We're talking 25,000, 50,000, hundreds of thousands of square feet. Offices left and right you drive by that are empty. At the same time, there's a tremendous need for housing, just a shortage of housing supply. The idea has come from several architects and developers, why not turn these office buildings into housing? Yeah. So we've been looking at that. Uh, it's not so easily done. It's a very different kind of floor plan and ceiling heights and mechanical systems and adding elevators and stairs and exits, but it makes a lot of sense. Why build a brand new condo building or high rise or residential building when these buildings exist and they have parking and they're already built and, and we need to go in and do a, a very surgical adaptive reuse. Now, this is interesting. So are, are the building codes for residential and commercial really that different in terms of elevators and stairwells? Because I would think a typical office building has a bunch of elevators and has a bunch of stairwells. Do they have to have more or less? Residential. Uh, there are a lot of there is a lot of crossover, which okay. is why it works. I think the biggest challenge is that the floor plates of an office building are very large, meaning you can't always get natural light all the way into the center of the building. Uh. Versus a apartment building or a condo building or townhomes, the floor plates are not large at all. So there's always natural light from from all sides from of all the unit. So we'd have to look in in one project we we have going on in Beverly Hills. We'd have to look at at carving into the building courtyards yeah. uh, to bring light right into the middle. Um, or do you just put your common areas in the middle, like your gym or your meeting room or Well, but even like a, that. a gym would want some windows. Yeah. Um, and, and there's only so many common areas you can create for a, a housing building. Okay. Um, but this is all kind of a, a new approach. There, there's been more and more articles coming out about it, so, so we'll see how it goes. But it is one of the more exciting things that we're, we're starting to talk about with, with our clients. What is your firm's website? It is poondesign.com. P as in Peter, O-O-N, design.com. Anthony, thanks so much for coming back by and talking with me again. George, thank you very much for having me. That was George talking with Anthony Poon. Architects Brett Woods and Joe Dangaran first met at USC. Go Trojans! And graduated in architecture in 2006. Brett worked on buildings for the Beijing Olympics in China, and Joe worked for Marmol Radziner. They founded their own firm, Woods Dangaran, in Los Angeles in 2013. I guess Joe lost the coin toss, but it's all good, as the firm has become wildly successful ever since. Devotees of modernism, they have created new residences and engaged in thoughtful restoration of projects, such as Craig Elwood's 1965 Moore House. Here's our conversation with Brett Woods and Joe Dangaran. Brett and Joe, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, been three years. Yeah, at least three years. And since then, you guys published a book. We did. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about the book. 
Well, book came out, I believe, in October <laughs> thereabouts. But it's, I think, a lifelong dream or fantasy of both Brent, myself, and the team to be able to one have the body of work, and then to go out photograph all these projects, do the drawings, get some great writers and people helping out on the book. But it's yeah, it's something we're very proud of and. I think it's pretty representative of the work that we've done, but also what we aspire to be. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's surreal, quite honestly. I mean, I think it's been a bit of a blur for me personally. And I think a lot of the events and a lot of the book signings have been wonderful, but at the same time, um, everything just seems to be happening so fast. But we're, we're proud, and the book speaks for itself and um, the work, and hopefully uh, we're working towards our second one already. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. So you've done some book signings? Just a few. Yeah, we've had we've had uh, two, three pretty large events, kind of celebratory <laughs> events with clients, with with our team and extended families and whatnot. And then we've done a handful of signings. And so, what are your architecture groupies like? <laughs> Other architects. <laughs> that is actually that's that is a that's a great question because it's part of these book signings. You you meet all these really wonderful people, and I don't think certainly I don't I don't realize the reach that we have architecturally until somebody's coming in front of you and, and talks about how much they, they love your work and they've been a big fan. And I think it's just one of those things where it's a reminder that, you know, these books and, and the work you do matters and the people come from all over the place to to tell you that. And it's, it's, it's rewarding. Now, can people buy this book on Amazon or do they have to stop by your office and bug you? They, they can come by the office anytime, but um, no, it's, so it's distributed by Rizzoli, which is 70 countries across the world. Am- big publisher, yeah. Yeah. Barnes & Noble, Amazon, kind of all the big. We always like to say support your local brick and mortar right. bookstore. So in Los Angeles, we have uh, Arcana Books and then Hennessy and Ingalls, which are great local art and architecture books. But we've been trying our best to reach out to kind of the brick and mortars in major cities across the, the U.S. And we're, we have some friends that are traveling and saw the book in Japan and, you know, in London Has it and the airport. Has translated? Not to m- no. my knowledge. No, it has not no. been translated. But it is interesting when we get these text messages and it's your book and somewhere in a different country. And so, again, at the reach. Are they incredible. holding up in front of the pyramids yet? That's always <laughs> no. the great shot. Uh, yeah, we're not there yeah. yet. <laughs> and have yeah. you sold the movie rights? Movie, there's no movie. I don't think there is a movie to be or a story to be told there <laughs> yet. The two of you met at a barbecue? Well, I mean, it was... We've known each other from from school, so there was plenty of barbecues. Um, yeah. And uh, this this one was when I when I returned home from North Carolina, and we were sitting around having a barbecue, talking about what are the next steps. And there was sort of this natural progression of our conversation about development of homes and building homes in a, in a sort of minimalist way. And so that's how it began, really. And here we are. Yeah, and it's been about uh, officially. This spring will be about ten years. So the book represents the first ten, ten years, years of work. in practice. And twenty thirteen, you started. Yeah, and then our goal is to to hopefully do a book every five years. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Now, which one of you worked for Marmo Red Zener? I did for did. Fi- for five years. Okay, yeah, because Leo was around uh-huh. here earlier. Yep, we saw Leo actually the other night and had a nice chat with him and and Ron, and then we gave a presentation yesterday at the Annenberg Theater. And I think Leo was there, but then scooted out before we had a chance to chat. But it, we have a lot of colleagues. I mean, even at this dinner, a lot of a lot of old friends, professors, things like that, which is great. I think Brett and I feel very fortunate to be in such a great kind of group of people in Los Angeles, uh, practicing architects that we look up to and others that are starting to follow us a little bit and yeah. look up to us. So that's kind of an interesting feeling as well. Now, have either of you hit 40 yet? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great question. Yes. Ha- ha- wasn't, wasn't 40 when I first did the interview, first did the podcast with you half three years us, ago. Half of us have yeah. been 40. Yeah. Yeah. So you two will be the ones that we're trying to preserve your houses in 30 years well, or well, 60 well, or it's, 70. I'm happy you said that. We, we talked about that a little bit at the, at the lecture yesterday that the greatest compliment anybody can give us is in you know, 30, 40 years, somebody wants to restore a home versus tear it down. And I think that's something that I think most architects wish would happen. Um, but we really think about it um, often. And we have those conversations with our clients. And I think that one thing that's great about some of the book and just our name getting out there is that the clients and potential clients that are reaching out to us, they've kind of already bought in to what we're doing. And so that conversation is a lot of fun, just talking about the intention and 
timeless quality of the homes that we're designing and executing that they want to be a part of that. So they want they want these homes to be restored and and not looked at as as being teardowns. Now you guys are doing new homes principally. You're part of this new modernist movement here in Palm Springs and LA and elsewhere. So for the kind of average non-architect person, what is some of the differences between the new modernism and the old school modernism? Well, I think that this is probably we can fill the whole podcast with this question, but we like to think of ourselves as maybe more rational modernists. I mean, I think modernism can be interpreted differently depending on who you're having a conversation with. Um, a lot of our work represents a control that you see from a lot of the old modernists, such as using the Craig Elwood. We talked about Craig yesterday in the Moore House that we renovated and restored. There's a consistency in the grid and expression and elevation. And so we try to replicate that or, or try to respect that. So I think the modernism from, from our standpoint is really about this sort of controlled set of standards that we have in our practice that we adhere to. We're not very playful with the work that we do. And we also use a lot of natural materials. So we try to stay away from, you know, these synthetic materials and sort of, and it's tough because technology is out there today and it allows for you to use these materials, but we try to stay true to these materials that are timeless that we think are timeless that have been around for a very long time. So those yeah. are some of the principles. Yeah. Well, Brett, those are some of the things that are the same Correct. about all modern. What's, what's different about new modernism? I think the, the difference is, and to be specific, I yeah. guess, the, the differences might be, you know, scale of spaces. I think people want bigger kitchens, big, maybe or bigger footprints. If let's say in the in the Moore House, if the width of that structure was sixteen feet or seventeen feet wide, we're now looking at hey, a space, a living room maybe is twenty or twenty two feet wide, and instead of eight foot ceilings, maybe those are ten foot ceilings or nine foot six ceilings, and the technology, the appliances, the systems, all those are are current, and what we're trying to do is really look for ways that let's say 30, 40 years from now, that things might be adapted and renovated easily versus kind of built in or, or things that are that are integral to structure. So I think scales, different finishes are, we have a lot of finishes that we can work with nowadays. Yeah, there are a lot of exterior finishes now that and, you can choose from. And tile and stone and wood veneer, wood paneling, you know, wood doors, hardware, all those things have evolved. But what we're trying to do is make from the design standpoint, those be timeless so that you don't know if they're built. So how do you take advantage of newer technology or new ideas without resorting to artificial materials if you're trying to use natural materials? Is there a way that it's smarter to do it now than it wasn't known about back in 50 years ago, 70 years ago? I think waterproofing systems have have evolved yeah, there's things you learn out the That's really way. important because you don't want that leaky roof syndrome, right? Right, which a lot of these homes have. Yeah. So, um, I, I think uh, going back to scale really quickly, I think it's interesting because we've seen this shift where, you know, maybe 10 years ago, bigger spaces were people wanted really big spaces. And we're finding today that a lot of our clients are like are wanting spaces that are smaller and more scale appropriate, more intimate and more to a human scale in the residential sector. So I think, you know, even though we talk a lot about these spaces being larger, the truth is we're really trying to pull these back in and and make them feel more intimate for the user. Is it easier these days to get approvals for most of your projects or is it taking longer? Approvals (laughs) from the local municipalities? No, it never gets easier in our experience. (laughs) And that's okay. I think that we, a very common question is, you know, oh, you guys probably hate hate the rules and regulations that you have to work under. And the truth is those are just constraints and a part of the the project brief that we we have to deal with all architects have to deal with and we try to use those and and maybe look at them in a different way and not in just the kind of uh, on its face and we actually i think are able to come up with some pretty creative solutions in the face of some of these restrictions and the most scary thing for us is a blank sheet of paper with no (laughs) no rules no parameters it's like where do you start yeah. What do you build? Because we're problem solvers, I think, by nature. Our, all architects are, are trying to synthesize information and create a solution. You're working in Desert Palisades here? Yeah, we are. Let's we talk are. about that. Sure. We have one finished home. That's actually my family home. And we have another one under construction. It's about 
probably a year. Was the client difficult to work with on Ferry. that? Very, uh, very. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <the> <laughs> It was more. It was more just uh, conversations in your mind. <laughs> Let's dig into at that. At three in the yeah. morning. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it was, it was actually going back to what Joe just just said a second ago about the parameters. I think the difficulty with Desert Palisades and building. And the last time we, we were talking with you, we were just under construction, so yeah. there was a lot of excitement around that. And the challenging part of Desert Palisades, especially when we were one of the first to build, we built with the Cappy House, is siding the house properly because there's no homes around you, right? So thinking about, you know, what this house is going to look like 10, 15 years from now, because once you have neighbors and adjacent structures and landscapes, is the house still going to have the same feeling? And so I think that was the biggest challenge. The architecture, I think, was fairly fell into place nicely, and it's, it's a beautiful structure. But the actual siding of the building was was challenging. But we, I think we got it right, but it definitely took some time. So when you're the client... Who do you get to have a second opinion on this? Joe. <laughs> I think that falls to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Usually when, when I'm banging my head against the wall, it's sort of like the challenge with design is you get these blinders on as you, you stare at something for so long. Like, yeah, I think any profession. And it's nice to have the counterbalance and someone who has a fresh set of eyes and can look at things differently than, than you are because you're so focused on maybe a few items that have nothing to do with really what the problem is in front of you. It's just it's a, it's a roadblock. Yeah. Well, and we've known each other, whether it's on Desert Palisades or any of the other projects in the studio, we've, we've known each other so long that we can tell when, when either of us are hitting a roadblock and that we need a little nudge in one direction or the other. I think that's part of the success of our partnership and friendship and relationship is we know when we can step in. Yeah. Is that the only house you've done in Desert Palisades? It is. Okay. Yeah, we have the other one in construction, but that's that's pretty much it. Okay. Um, but that's another one. Yeah. That's, that's another one, yeah. Okay, that's, that's that counts. That's two. That's in, two. So in construction. In construction. <laughs> yeah. One finished and one in construction. And it's going to be a beautiful home. It'll be a really lovely home. There's a lot of great work going on right now up there. It's, it's a bit of a slow burn because of going back to municipalities and getting through um, the permitting process. It's, it's difficult in Desert Palisades. There's a few more hurdles than most places in, in Palm Springs. But there's some work up there going on right now that's, that's going to be great, going to level up the kind of development, and we'll see what the next generation looks like from, from these. Is sort of thinking about these projects as sort of the base, the floor, um, and where it goes from there. You said earlier there's such a huge array of choices now in these materials that you've got to come to agreement on it and your client has to come to agreement on it. Are you using any kind of technologies like VR or other things to have people visualize this? Sure. That's a great question that speaks to process. And we are investigating daily how we can evolve because I think one of the things that Brett and I both feel very strongly about is that if we don't evolve, we'll become dinosaurs and we won't be able to have these types of conversations because no one will care about the work that we're doing. And the truth is we we want to just push and be better every day. And technology, one thing that's interesting, there are hot technologies that can come and be like a, you know, a very fast flash in the pan and be gone and, and not adopted. And then there are others that can last for a long time. So we're in we're in Revit, with, which is building information modeling. So it's 3D building. Uh, we do all of our projects in that software that's been around 15 plus years. Uh, but then we're looking at VR, we're looking at, we still do physical models, we look at renderings. Every client communicates differently, and so there's a kind of a tailored process for each and every client, uh, depending on how they visualize. Some love looking at floor plans, others want to look at axonometric drawings or only look at perspective sections or, or VR. So everyone's a little different, but we kind of hit the milestones of the overall process. I think the biggest challenge for us in our office right now is using the right kind of technology for our process. I think we have a process that works and implementation of technology is necessary to, again, grow. But if it comes too fast or if you're using the wrong technology, is it going to change your process? Is it going to change your product? How quickly you communicate with a client if you're too many steps ahead that you should be in a process because you need the time to kind of get there. So I think it's a bit of a challenge sometimes with the process conversation and technology because the technology is constantly challenging our process. Again, good and bad, right? Yeah, right. So there is such a thing as showing a client something too soon and too quickly right. before they've had a chance to get there, before we've had a chance to really develop. And that can actually make you take a few steps back in the process. So we've kind of been learning that over the last 10 years in terms of how 
how far do we push? And, and there are these kind of milestones that we've developed in the process. So Now, you guys are doing these great single-family homes. Have you gotten on the ADU bandwagon at all? Are people calling up and uh-huh. saying, I need my mother-in-law suite in the backyard? <laughs> Not really. No, I mean, I think there. some of our clients may want a detached structure for the, the in-law suite or the, the family yeah. suite, and we're seeing that, but no one's really coming to us specifically just for an ADU. Yeah. We haven't received too many calls on that. So yeah. the houses that you're building now don't have ADUs? They don't, okay. typically. Could they have They would have, like, added? pool houses or little yeah, casitas, right? Well, uh-huh. Exactly. I, I yeah. think one of the things that's exciting for us, just to come back and listen to the podcast from three years ago, that... At that point in time, we were really based in Southern California, and now we're in eight, nine states across the country, primarily in the West, but then also in Greenwich, Connecticut. And one of the things, Brett was talking about the site planning process for Desert Palisades, which that property is about half an acre up in Desert Palisades. We're now getting an opportunity to work on properties with seven acres, 20 acres, some even even more, which is really exciting for us because the site planning becomes such a critical part of the success of a project. Mm-hmm. How do you how do you drive your car in and out? How do you make the pedestrian experience private and and kind of serene versus the vehicular? And I think that that and where do you put the car collection that your client? Has? <laughs> well, we don't have any. I, yeah. I don't think any car. That's a big thing so now. You know, it is. It yeah. is. We don't have any with like the the fifty car under that we know of garage that we know <laughs> of. That's yeah, right. they might have them. That's right. I mean, I think going back to the ADU qu- question, a lot of these estate right. projects that we're working on now, sort of the next generation of projects in our office, mm-hmm. will have multiple structures, and naturally because the properties are so big and yeah. you, you want to spread out. So it's it's nice for us because there's a, sort of this growth from the last time that we met with you. We were doing a lot of these sort of urban infill projects because of the nature of where the location was of, in L.A. Now that we're kind of spread out in these different states and having actual acreage to work on, yeah. it's sort of um, it's been really exciting for us in our office. Have you taken payment for a project in Bitcoin yet? No. No? Has I, anybody offered? No. No. They I, will. It's coming. Well, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Have you? <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I think it's fair to say we're we're pretty conservative on the on the business side of things. I don't know if we'd be receiving payment in. I mean, maybe the future. Oh, yeah, it's, Who it's knows? All, it's, it's, all, it's all the rage. Maybe. I'll tell know. you how to do it. <laughs> okay. I, don't I don't know. Let us know. There's so many different payment systems now that are emerging all around the world, and people are creating asset classes, right? That they're going to want to turn into real estate at some point and hire architects like you. So. You know, it's the future, guys. Maybe that is the future. <laughs> See, maybe I already am a dinosaur. And well, this, I think the scariest part of the future is like AI, right? So, yeah. you know, I, you read a lot well, about people, yeah. you know, pushing a button and just sort of designing a house for you. Yeah. Um, I wonder what that future looks like because, or how quickly that's coming. Well, I mean, it's here, yeah. but, but it's... then the house has no front door. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. It's one of those... Yeah, one of our clients was in a meeting kind of experimenting with that with that software where... It's essentially coding for visual renderings and things like that and just playing with keywords. And you can get lost in it and it can entertain you for a little bit. But and the images that come out are are subjectively beautiful, right? Oh, yeah. There's like Frank Lloyd Wright's, you know, what would a car be if Frank Lloyd Wright designed it? That was on the Internet recently. It's really fascinating. But I, I, I think getting the specifics of it are really challenging. And well, maybe it's a good start. But then a human needs to come along. Might be. And yeah. clean it up. Yeah. One would Frank think. Frank Lloyd Wright car wouldn't go my more than five miles without breaking down. <laughs> but it would look beautiful while it Yeah. Was. That's a great that's a good one. perspective. <laughs> Part of what I see coming along is that contrary to popular belief right now, you know, architects are resisting AI because they're worried about it. It's going to replace them, blah, blah, blah. But I see architects really being among the first to engage AI because who wants to do the bathroom detail? Nobody. And if you can get your robot to do that. We do. You do? We do. We do. We might. So much for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) No, it's the... How about the laundry room? They say we're control freaks. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah, I think we're a little too type A to let AI... It's interesting. Let's use the bathroom example or the laundry room example, right? I think that Brett and I, in, in our careers prior to starting the firm, you know, we detailed all of those items. And I think that there's something really critical 
to being a young architect coming right out of school and being exposed to, hey, what's a cabinetry detail? What's a what's a detail of backsplash to mirror to upper cabinet? And how do you detail that out and coordinate under cabinet lighting, et cetera? And I think that one of the, I guess, the risks of AI is that um, you don't get an opportunity to learn that, right? Let's say we implemented that or like on a skyscraper, we always use the, the example, on every skyscraper, someone detailed the exit stairs. Someone detailed the egress stair and did 80 floors of egress stair detailing. That might seem monotonous, but if you got AI to do that, someone's going to miss out on learning that. And we would probably take the stance that that's knowledge lost, that you still, people still need to train and learn and, and do yeah. all these things. And I, I tell the team, I would love to take an afternoon and put on my headphones and detail cabinetry in a home, but that's not where we are right now. And I can't, I can't afford to do can't that do that anymore, but I love doing, I used to love doing that. So those things I think are really important. We look at our studio, maybe in that sense, a bit more academically in trying to train young architects and you only get to train if you have those opportunities and those projects and, and things like that. Well, it's also, it's interesting to see where all of these young architects are coming out of school and what they're actually learning in school. You know, it just depends on what school they come from, but also just the, the way that they're teaching today changes. And so it's, it's just interesting. And, and I think it's something that, you know, to Joe's point, is it's part of the process of learning how to become a, a, a young architect and sort of put through the paces. And you get something from that. You get something really powerful, which is you feel more confident to move to that next step. Right. And so I think the AI conversation is a little bit scary on that regard, because I think you could miss out on some steps that are necessary for you to become a great architect. That's kind of foundation. Yeah. What's, what scares me even more is how is how is AI going to be utilized in academia? And already <laughs> already it's, it's really interesting. I heard, you know, a few weeks ago that the, it's the chat GBT, right? Yeah. That the developer of chat GBT also developed a, a software that now teachers can use to check and check the likelihood of a book report. What's the percentage of likelihood that that book report was written by chat? GBT it's been versus... watermarked. Certain words get used more often than it's others. very interesting. And, and wait till somebody figures an end run around that. Of course. And that's, <laughs> you'll have a bot for your bot. That's right. Yeah. It sounds like, right? Yeah, exactly. It's a growth industry. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, there you go. Sky's the limit. Bots everywhere. When you guys are doing a restoration like on the Elwood House. How do you find builders that can handle this? Because every builder will tell you, oh, sure, I can do this, but they really can't. That's a great... Or, or a client that can handle it. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. You know, they're, they're both sort of, they're the same. It takes a lot of trust from the client and commitment from them, but you're right, it takes a, a builder with um, patience. You know, where's the Elwood Whisperer? The Elwood Whisperer, <laughs> that's funny. Um, you know, for that project... We worked with a, a builder, Jeff Hackett, who has since moved from L.A., but it's really just going back to details, detail-oriented, right? I think that that everyone needs to buy into the detailed nature of these homes and just how... I, one of the things that we find really fascinating is that looking back at mid-century architects and you know renovation, restoration projects, a lot of these homes have been put up on pedestals, and rightly so from a design standpoint, but from the execution, from the construction standpoint... We may look at a tolerance in desert, desert palisades of a 16th of an inch or an eighth of an inch, but back when the Moore House was built in 1965, that same level of detail may have been to the half inch or the three quarter inch. Really? And so, yeah, they, these were built, most of these homes were built for $15,000, $20,000 at that time. And so to take them apart and put them back together again for today's standards, that's the challenge. And finding a builder that, you know, we have to level off ceilings if we're replacing drywall and these these things over time. And was that a to, function of the cost of the house, the price point they expected to hit? I think it's the evolution of expectations of quality of construction. Okay. And and I think the designs were really revolutionary, but the technology wasn't there to back them up, which is why you have a lot of these roofing systems that have failed because of low slope roofs or zero slope roofs. Yeah. Things like that. Getting back to waterproofing. Yeah, get, well, always, always well, back to waterproofing. I think, I think the Elwood whispers. I don't think it's the GC. I think it's the architect. I think any any one of our builders could build the Elwood house. I think it's it's the process that we put in place that controls. You have better builders than we do, then, because ours don't. They well, can't do it. It's tough. Well, the, it's taken years to get there for us. I mean, we've we, we're at a place now where we have uh, great 
a handful of builders that we use in a lot of our projects, and we've worked hard to kind of get into that, you know, develop those relationships yeah. um, with our projects, and they all, each one of them can handle, because if a builder cannot handle the level of detail in your, your documents, then the, you know that's that's where you realize quickly that they can't right. do this. New construction or renovation. Yeah, right. and I think that's that's the point is that it, you know if we if you're investing in this set of drawings that are highly detailed, the builder needs to be able to have a process that can handle those details. This is the brown M and M's thing, you know, in the Van Halen oh, on yeah. stage contracts. Uh huh. And it uh-huh. Is, wasn't that they didn't want brown M and M's uh-huh. backstage; is that they wanted to make sure that. The promoter read the contract. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a little, a little. I Easter, didn't know that little piece of music. little oh, yeah. Easter eggs yeah. in there. Yeah, for sure. Got to go. Got to go yeah. find them. Yeah. Um, Brett brings up a really good point about the the builder, the architect, but also the owner has to invest has to invest in that quality builder. And we all know that not every owner can invest in the builder that they may want, even though a home that they own requires renovation or restoration work. So it's always that matching up of budget. To, to expectation. I think that that's a really big part of any project that we do is, first of all, understanding the expectation of the client and being aligned and then understanding and communicating to them what that means from a budget standpoint, from a mm-hmm. construction timeline standpoint, from an availability of, of finishes and materials and systems. So that we kind of get to marry, again, back to the synthesis of a bunch of different information. That's what we do every day is Try to align all those all those different aspects that have to come together for a project to one be built and then two be successful. Brett and Joe's website is woodsdangerin.com. That's W O O D S D A N G A R A N dot com. Thank you guys for coming back. Thanks, thanks for having us again. It always goes too quick. This has been great. <laughs> it does. We were chatting with architects Brett Woods and Joe Dangarin. Interior designer Sean Gaston is originally from Denver, Colorado. He went to high school in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and studied at Arizona State University. Go Sun Devils! Sure. (laughs) Influenced by his mother and grandmother, who redecorated with the seasons, Sean is known for his artful blend of vintage and modern furnishings, hunted and gathered from flea markets and estate sales. He directs design for residential builder B. Renovated, owned by his husband Jim Jewell. They recently renovated the Stonehenge residence, the 1974 Jim Walling house. Even better, as we are super fans of hyperbolic paraboloid houses, he's taken on the renovation of a spectacular Walter White home in Indio, California. And by Walter White, we're not talking about Brian Cranston's character in Breaking Bad. This Walter, the architect, came way before the TV show. Here's our conversation with designer and homeowner Sean Gaston. Sean, you have really become a uh, entrepreneur of modernist houses here. I mean, you've got one terrific house, <laughs> the Stonehenge House. Yes, sir. and you're taking on another project in Indio. Yes, a major one. So let's start with uh, the house you've had for a couple of years. Yeah, uh, with your partner Jim. Tell Ye- us about that one. Yeah, um, we're actually there almost five years, which, if you can believe it, we can't. It was built in 1974 by John Walling. He's done a number of houses up in our area, and he is still practicing. He is in his late 80s and just recently closed his physical office, but he's still operating. It's very organic. Um, It's different than what you would think you would see in Palm Springs. It's a lot of wood, a lot of texture. When we got it, it was in pretty much original condition. A gentleman from Chicago built it in the 70s. And when did you get it? uh, Five years ago. Okay. Yeah. So a gentleman built it in the 70s, and they were trying to make the area that we live in, which is Andreas Hills, which is in the southernmost part of Palm Springs, into a tennis estate development. So many of the homes have these massive tennis courts. And I understand our house was just the second house built up there. The gentleman really never lived there, and it went through a couple other owners. And for about a 20-year period, it was only occupied one week a year for 20 years. Oh, wow. That's so, a low mileage used car. Yeah, major. <laughs> I mean, it still had new house smell. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was just pristine. And and you've been to the house. Yes. I mean, the, the tile is original. All the woodwork is original. The windows are original, and they're still in amazing shape. We've spent most of our time preserving what's there, and the money has gone to the infrastructure. 
the stuff you don't see. Like what? Like updating the electrical systems, the plumbing. You know, when stuff's not used for yeah. that many years. Yeah, sometimes you, that's good news, sometimes that's bad news. Yeah, well, it's just like a car. If you buy yeah. an old car and it hasn't been run, you got to, you know, yeah, look at tire replace rock. everything. Yeah. Right. So we've um, just spent our time studying plans, actually having Mr. Walling over to the house. What's cool is he hadn't been to the home since selling it. So when he walked in, yeah. I was able to say, you know, what's yours? What's not yours? Do you remember this tile? Do you remember that? And it's interesting, not not much has changed. Well, you're lucky to have that perspective. Oh, it's wonderful. Wow. It really is. Because we've had the opposite. Your, your house won a preservation award. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. And it sounds like you cheated, really. I mean, since it was in <laughs> such good condition already. Ah, uh, you're the first person to say it, but I'll tell you, I agree. Yeah, no, it's been it's been amazing. There is a lot of work um, to do a preservation, you know, to maintain the look and the feel of a house. In your defense. That's right. Right. Yes. That's right. So um, we've done everything we can to to keep it original. And how is it to live in the house? Oh, it's amazing. Um, what I like about it is it's a it's a rather large house. It's 5,000 square feet. Oh, wow. That is big. Yeah. But um, unlike newer homes that they're building today with the giant 15, 20-foot ceilings and the great rooms, it's a large footprint, but then it's got smaller areas where you can feel more comfortable in the house, more livable. So we really spend all of our time in the family room, the kitchen. It's nice and cozy. Um, How many bedrooms are in there? There's only three. Okay. And I can tell you that the person that built it didn't want guests to stay around too long. <laughs> the, the guest bedrooms, and apparently neither did he. Yeah. <laughs> the guest bedrooms are are rather small, so the uh-huh. bulk of the square footage is for partying. You know, there's a beautiful built-in um, bar, sunken bar. So he wanted to throw parties, but he didn't want anybody to spend the night. You got it. You got it. And I'll tell you. There's a psychological case study right there. I can tell you it works. Oh, yeah. Okay. (laughs) It works. Our guests, you know, three days tops and ready to roll. Yeah, ready to roll. So we we love the house. And it just shows that, you know, if an architect thinks long term, that those sorts of floor plans or materials, they can last. People can still live in them. People can still enjoy them as they are meant to be. So on the heels of your preservation award, Mm -hmm. you've gone down Valley to take on another project. Yes, sir. Yes. I got an inquiry through my website of somebody having a project down in India, which is rather an unusual spot for a job, a big design job. And I thought, what? What is this guy talking about? And so I didn't really answer him right away. And then eventually I did. I did. And then I remembered going to an estate sale down in Indio at a house, the Wilkinson house. Um, and that was the house. Oh. Yeah. So talk about just the best surprise ever. Right. The one house you'd been in. Yeah. And you're back at. Yeah. And it was, you know, the thing I like about the project is the house is so unusual and it really is. It's spectacular in its architecture, in its design, in its roof line. But it was a family home that my clients bought it from the family that lived there for, I think, 40 years. And it was pretty much decorated like, remember Golden Girls? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like (laughs) mauve and, and baby blue. And she had all of her windows, I mean, giant windows, Little cotton valances <laughs> on the windows and window um, treatments. Yeah, window treatments yeah, and really gotta love them. <laughs> yeah, really pretty wallpaper and so it was interesting to see that sort of you, what you expect on the outside and when you go on the inside, it was completely different. But they had really not touched too much, which was great. This house has an unusual shape. Yes, it does. What is it? It is the call. Let's see if I get it right. The hyperbolic paraboloid roof. There you go. <laughs> That's the one. We know that term. <laughs> right. Yes. Is that, is that Dorton Arena? Uh, Dorton Arena and okay. the Catalano House. Okay. Yeah. There's a big arena in Raleigh that's. Oh, really? Got a hyperbolic paraboloid. Well, roof, and it's just like the um, which the nobody Center. would be able to say. The tram. I, I've tried. I, right. You see, I yeah. The the tram built by Frey, and legend has it that um, Frey met with Walter White, because this was built in 58, to learn about 
the structure and how it's made. Um, there's an amazing picture. Um, so when, was yeah. Walter like the expert in this sort of construction? I think he was one of the, what's my word? Pioneers? Yes. One of huh. the pioneers of it. I'm sure there's others, but um, in the desert, it seems like this is the one that kind of spurred on others. We have an entire archive now of Walter White projects at U.S. Modernist. It's usmodernist.org slash white. As you were looking at the house, a lot of these with the hyperbolic paraboloid roofs mm -hmm. have structural problems mm -hmm. in the roof. Did you encounter that? We only found one leak over the primary bathroom, and that's really all that was noticed. Other than that, it's pretty, pretty well preserved. I believe that the former owners put on a new foam roof mm -hmm. over the existing roof, which is um, something they do down here to protect, and that seems to have done the trick. Okay. Mm -hmm. That also protects from the heat to a certain extent? Yes, it sure does. It sure does. The way the house was built, um, speaking of heat, if you look at the plans that were done, he actually has little notes and lines of exactly what mountain range is out the front, out the side. It almost looks like a clock. So you see the roof of the house and then almost like a little clock. And he even has dates on it where it says December 20 whatever sunlight will come in through here. Oh. So, so... That's like um, ancient Stonehenge. Uh, it's, it's amazing and so well thought out. I mean, now you just, you know, put it on the lot and where it yeah. can go, but this was so... But, I mean, that's one of the hallmarks of mid-century modernist design is integration with the surrounding landscape. Yes. That's yes. an attention to detail. Yes, yes. And the, the main point of the roof is pointing directly at the peak of, I'm not sure exactly which mountain it is, but it is very specific that it, that's the direction it's pointing. What are some of the things that you will be doing to the house as you work to design and improve it? Well, I, I can say that it's not going to be a museum. It won't be a surgical preservation. My clients purchased it knowing that it was something special, but they didn't realize how special it was. Then when I came on board, I started saying, oh my gosh, you guys, do you realize what you have? Do you realize what you have? But their intention is to share it with people. So it's going to be available for events, for lectures, for weddings, photo shoots. Um, you can even stay there. So it is going to be open to people. The grounds will be made so that you can have a nice event out there, bigger pool, fire pits and stuff like that. The inside of the house, I've done everything I can to keep the original floor plan as much as I possibly could. The one thing that we, you, you know, back in the day, the kitchen was completely separate from the area. Like that was where you went and you worked and you made dinner and then you brought it out in your high heels and your. Or later <laughs> on, you might have passed it through a hole <laughs> yeah, in the right, wall. Right. right. But, but nowadays, the kitchen is really the center of entertainment. Like it, it, yeah. things have changed. So one thing that we did do that altered the footprint was we opened up a wall in between the formal living room and the kitchen, which provided this great connection. But right. then also from the living room, you can see just these amazing date palm groves and mountains. So, um, that's, so it opens up the view inside and to the outside. Yes, so, that's right. So that's your big change in the floor plan. That's the big change in the floor plan. Mm -hmm. I, I fought it a little bit with my, I was being a little more uh, strict with what we were doing to the house and I fought a little bit with my client, just arguing back and forth. We shouldn't change it. We shouldn't change it. And now that we did change it and we updated it, I really, I think Walter White would, would be proud of it. Have you visited any other Walter White projects in yes, preparation I, for this? I, I went to the Wave House, which was part of modernism a number of years back, where it was on auction and you could purchase it. And then you were, you know, going to restore it and all that. So that's the one that I'm most familiar with. I'm learning more and more and more about Walter White. I'm, I'm sort of a newbie to him. And that's what's making doing this project even that more fun. He doesn't get mentioned a lot in the pantheon of Palm Springs architects. He doesn't. But he really is emerging as someone who made some important contributions. I agree. And I think this is an unearthing of a jewel in the desert 
you know, overgrown. It was, you, you could barely see it with the foliage and just the stuff that was out there. But now that they've trimmed back all the trees and exposed it, you can see how important it is. It actually sits up on a dune. So it is like up on a pedestal <laughs> presented. And now it's all crispy white and repainted and just looks, I, I, it really does look like a diamond on a, on a hill. Is it about done? How far are you from completion? Oh, my God. You look, see the bags under my eyes? <laughs> <laughs> we're getting, we're getting, we got a tight deadline. Um, we're going to be doing two phases. So the first phase is going to be um, just a general paint, new tile, cleaning up, not doing so much the larger pieces. There's going to be an event there, so it will look great. But then after that's done, we will move on to phase two, which will be the bigger things, like replacing all the windows that were in kind to what Walter White did. When are you going to take out that wall? So the, the wall is gone. Oh, it's gone. The okay. wall is gone. Well, that was yes. phase zero. Yeah. <laughs> okay. it, it was on the chopping block. Okay. But yeah, no, um, the interior will be great and done and I'll have it, you know, completely furnished and the exterior will be mostly done. But there's a couple casitas. There's actually three casitas. One which used to be sort of a little apartment, which is original to the property. And then another right. little office. Okay. What's a casita? A casita is... It's like an ADU, Tom. Oh, okay. Yeah, for, for guests. Yeah. So then it's got a little bathroom. It's and, just the Southwest name. Okay. Well, I thought ADU was the Southwest name. <laughs> no, that's the national name. The, the little houses. That's right. Yeah. It's a cute little house for yeah. your guests Mother-in-law to house, we yeah, say right. in the South. Right. Yep. Right. So there's three on the property? Wow. There are three on the property already, yes. So Are there um, any mother-in-laws in them? <clears throat> Not when I <laughs> found the property. Okay. Um, yeah, so it, it will be able to have probably 12 people be able to enjoy it there if they wanted to, to spend the night, like a great family reunion spot or mm -hmm. um, So do you a have wedding. a feel for when the end of phase two will be? Or yes. Are you hoping for? Yes. Uh, we are striving to be done for October Modernism. Okay. Um, next year. And it will be what we would call in retail a soft opening. So we won't really advertise it massively. But then come around the February, a year from now, that's when it will get its big um, okay. big debut. So we'll see you in a year. Yes. And you'll be, your bags will be bigger. <laughs> and I'll have less hair than I have now. <laughs> and I'm bald. Yes. <laughs> Sean, thanks so much for stopping in and sharing this story. We can't wait to see how the house turns out. Yeah, I can't wait for you guys to come. That was our conversation with Sean Gaston. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. Want to go with us to Modernism Week in 2024 and stay with us at the U.S. Modernist Compound? Email me, george at usmodernist.org. Okay, Tom, take us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 20,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4.1 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Rogue archivist Kelly Policelli researched all the guests for our Modernism Week interviews. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I will be back in two weeks with another Drinkin' Martinis edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. 